Hi there, I'm Nalani Brown, the philanthropy coordinator from Frank Toby Jones. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Today, I'm going to bring you a story by Agatha Christie, and it's called Four and Twenty Blackbirds. Hercule Poirot was dining with his friend, Henry Bonington, at the gallant endeavor in the King's Road, Chelsea. Mr. Bonington was fond of the gallant endeavor. He liked the leisurely atmosphere. He liked the food, which was plain and English, and not a lot made, not a lot of made up messes. He liked to tell people who dined with him they're just exactly where Augustus John had been, wont to sit and draw their attention to the famous artist's name in the visitor's book. Mr. Bonington was himself at least artistic, the least artistic of men, but he took a certain pride in the artistic activity of, of others. Molly, the sympathetic waitress, greeted Mr. Bonington as an old friend. She prided herself on remembering her customers' likes and dislikes in the way of food. Good evening, sir, she said, as the two men took their seats at a corner table. You're in luck today. Turkey stuffed with chestnuts. That's your favorite, isn't it? And ever such a nice stitlin we've got. Will you have soup first or fish? Mr. Bonington deliberated the point. He said to Poirot, warningly as the latter studied the menu. None of your French chick saws now. Good, well-cooked English food. My friend, Hercule Poirot waved his hand. I ask no better. I put myself in your, in your hands unreservedly. Ah, uh, mm, replied Mr. Bonington and gave careful attention to the matter. The weight, these weighty matters, and the question of wine, settled Mr. Bonington, leaned back with a sigh and unfolded his napkin as Molly sped away. Good girl that, he said approvingly, was quite a beauty once. Artists used to paint her. She knows about food too, and that's a great deal more important. Women are very unsound on a food as a rule. There's many a woman if she goes out with a fellow she fancies, won't even notice what she eats. She'll just order the first thing she sees. Hercule Poirot shook his head. Sis terrible. Men aren't like that, thank God, said Mr. Bonington complacently. Never? There was a twinkle in Hercule Poirot's eye. Well, perhaps when they're very young, conceded Mr. Bonington. Young puppies. Young fellows nowadays are all the same. No guts, no stamina. I've no use for the young. And they, he added with strict Im impartial, <laughs> he added with strict impartiality, have no use for me. Perhaps they're right. But to hear some of these young fellows talk, you'd think no man had a right to be alive after 60. From the way they go on, you'd wonder more of them didn't help their elderly relations out of the world. It is possible, said Hercule Poirot, Poirot that they do. Nice mind you've got, Poirot, I must say. All this police work saps your ideals. Hercule Poirot smiled. de meme, he said. It would be interesting to make a table of accidental deaths over the age of 60. I assure you it would raise some curious speculations in your mind. The trouble with you is that you've started going to look for crime instead of waiting for crimes to come to you. I apologize, said Poirot. I talk to, I talk what you call the shop. Tell me, my friend, of your own affairs. How does the world go for you? Mess, said Bonington. That's what the matter with the world. That's what's the matter with the world nowadays. Too much mess and too much fine language. The fine language helps to conceal the mess. Like a highly flavored sauce concealing the fact that the fish underneath it is none of the best. Give me an honest filet of sole and no messy sauce over it. It was given him at that moment by Molly and he grunted approval. You know just what I like, my girl, he said. Well, 
You come here pretty regular, don't you, sir? I ought to know what you like. Hercule Poirot said, Do people then always like the same things? Do not they like a change sometimes? Not gentlemen, sir. Ladies like a variety. Gentlemen, always the same thing. What did I tell you, grunted Bonnington. Women are fundamentally unsound where food is concerned. He looked around the restaurant. The world's a funny place. See that odd looking old fellow with a beard in the corner? Molly will tell you he's here every Tuesday and Thursday night. He has come here for close to 10 years now. He's kind of a landmark in the place. Yet nobody here knows his name or where he lives or what business it, his business is. It's odd when you come to think of it. When the waitress brought the portions of turkey, he said, I see you've still got old father time over there. That's right, sir. Tuesdays and Thursdays, his days are. Not but what he came in here on a Monday last week. It quite upset me. I felt I got my dates wrong and that it must be Tuesday without knowing it. But he came in the next night as well. So the Monday was just kind of extra, so to speak. An interesting deviation from habit, murmured Poirot. I wonder what the reason was. Well, sir, if you ask me, I think he had some kind of upset or worry. Why did you think that? His manner? No, sir, not his manner exactly. He was very quiet as he always is. Never says much except good evening when he comes and goes. No, it was his order. His order? I dare say you gentlemen will laugh at me. Molly flushed. But when a gentleman has been here for 10 years, you get to know his likes and dislikes. He never could bear suet pudding or blackberries, and I've never known him to take thick soup. But on Monday night, he ordered thick tomato soup, beef steak, and kidney pudding, and blackberry tart. Seemed as though he just didn't notice what he ordered. Do you know, said Hercule Poirot, I find that extraordinarily interesting. Molly looked gratified and departed. Well, Poirot, said Henry Bonington with a chuckle, let's have a few deductions from you, all in your best manner. I would prefer to hear you first. Want me to be Watson, eh? Well, old fellow went to a doctor and the doctor changed his diet. To thick tomato soup, steak and kidney pudding and blackberry tart, I cannot imagine any doctor doing that. I don't believe it, old boy. Doctors will put you on to anything. There is only one solution that occurs to you, Henry Bonington said. Well, seriously, I suppose there's only one explanation possible. Our unknown friend was in the grip of some powerful mental emotion. He was so protruded by it that he literally did not notice what he was ordering or eating. He paused a minute, then said, You'll be telling me next that you know just what was on his mind. You'll say perhaps that he was making up his mind to commit a murder. He laughed at his own suggestion. <laughs> Hercule Poirot did not laugh. He admitted that at that moment he was seriously worried. He claims that he ought to have had some inkling of what was likely to occur. His friends assure him that such an idea is quite fantastic. It was some three weeks later that Hercule Poirot and Bonington met again. This time their meeting was in the tube. They nodded to each other, swaying about, hanging on to adjacent straps. Then at Piccadilly Circus, there was a general exodus and they found seats right at the forward end of the car. A peaceful spot since nobody passed in or out that way. Ah, that's better, said Bonington. Selfish lot, the human race, they won't pass up the car however much you ask them to. Hercule Poirot shrugged his shoulders. What will you do, he said. Life's too uncertain. That's it. Here today, gone tomorrow, said Mr. Bonington, with a kind of gloomy relish. And talking of that, do you remember that old boy we noticed at the gallant endeavor? I shouldn't wonder if he'd hopped, hoped it to do a better world. He's not here, and he's not been here for a whole week. Molly's quite upset about it. Hercule Poirot sat up. His green eyes flashed. Indeed, he said, indeed. And Bonington said, do you remember I suggested he'd been to a doctor and he'd been put on a diet? 
Diet's nonsense, of course, but I shouldn't wonder if he had consulted a doctor about his health and what the doctor said gave him a bit of a jolt. That would account for him ordering things off the menu without noticing what he was doing. Quite likely the jolt he got hurried him out of the world sooner than he would have gone otherwise. Doctors ought to be careful what they tell a chap. They usually are, said Hercule Poirot. This is my station, said Mr. Bonington. Bye-bye. Don't suppose we shall ever know now who the old boy was. Not even his name. Funny world. He hurried out of the carriage. Hercule Poirot, sitting frowning, looked as though he did not think it was such a funny world. He went home and gave certain instructions to his faithful valet, George. Hercule Poirot ran his finger down a list of names. It was a record of deaths within a certain area. Poirot's fingers stopped. Henry Gascoigne, Gascoigne, 69. I might try him first. Later in the day, Hercule Poirot was sitting with Dr. McAndrew's surgery just off King's Road. McAndrew was a tall, red-haired Scotsman with an intelligent face. Gascoigne, Gascoigne, he said. Yes, that's right. Eccentric old bird. Lived alone in one of those derelict old, house, derelict old houses that are being cleared away in order to build a block of modern flats. I hadn't attended him before, but I had seen him about and I knew who he was. It was the diary people got the wind up first. The milk bottles began to pile up outside. It was the dairy people got the wind up first. The milk bottles began to pile up outside. In the end, the people next door sent word to the police, and they broke the door in and found him. He'd pitched down the stairs and broken his neck. Had an old dressing gown with a ragged cord, might easily have tripped himself with it. I see, said Hercule Poirot. It was quite simple, an accident. That's right. Had he any relations? Ah, there's a nephew. Used to come along and see his uncle about once a month. Lorimer. His name is George Lorimer. He's a medico himself. Lives in Wimbledon. And was he upset at the old man's death? I don't know that I'd say he was upset. I mean, he had an affection for the old man, but he didn't really know him very well. How long had Mr. Gascoigne been dead when you saw him? Ah, said Dr. McAndrew. This is where we get official. Not less than 48 hours and not more than 72 hours. He was found on the morning of the 6th. Actually, we got closer than that. He'd got a letter in the pocket of his dressing gown written on the 3rd, posted in Wimbledon, Wimbledon that afternoon. Would have been delivered somewhere around 9.20 p.m. That puts the time of death at after 9.20 on the evening of the 3rd. That agrees with the contents of the stomach and the process of digestion. He had a meal about two hours before death. I examined him on the morning of the 6th and his condition was quite consistent with the death having occurred about 60 hours previously, round about 10 p.m. on the 3rd. It all seems very consistent. Tell me, when was he last seen alive? He was seen in the King's Road about seven o'clock that same evening, Thursday the 3rd, and he dined at the Gallant Endeavor restaurant at 7.30. It seems he always dined there on Thursdays. He was by way of being an artist, you know, an extremely bad one. Had he no other relations, only his nephew? There was a twin brother. The whole story is rather curious. They hadn't seen each other for years. It seems the other brother, Anthony Gascon married a very rich woman and gave up art, and the brothers quarreled over it. Hadn't seen each other since, I believe. But oddly enough, they died on the same day. The elder twin passed away at three o'clock on the afternoon of the third. Once before, I've known a case of twins dying on the same day, in different parts of the world, probably just a coincidence. But there is, there it is, hmm. Is the other brother's wife alive? No, she died some years ago. And so where did Anthony Gascoigne live? He had a house on Kingston Hill. He was, I believe, from what Dr. Lorimer tells me, very much of a recluse. 
Hercule Poirot nodded thoughtfully. The Scotsman looked at him keenly. What exactly have you got in your mind, M. Poirot? He asked bluntly. I've answered your questions, as was my duty seeing the credentials you brought, but I'm in the dark as to what it's all about. Poirot said slowly, a simple case of accidental death. That's what you said. What I have in mind is equally simple, a simple push. Dr. McAndrew looked startled. In other words, murder? Have you any grounds for that belief? No, said Poirot. It's a mere, subs it's a mere supposition. There must be something, persisted the other. Poirot did not speak, McAndrew said. If it's the nephew, Lorimer, you suspect, I don't mind telling you here and now that you are barking up the wrong tree. Lorimer was playing bridge in Wimbledon from 8.30 till midnight. That came up at the inquest. Poirot murmured, and, presum and presumably it was verified. The police are not careful. The doctor said, perhaps you know something against him? I didn't know what... I didn't know that there was such a person until you mentioned him. Then you suspect someone else. No, no, it is not that at all. It's a case of the routine habits of the human animal. It's very important. And the dead Mr. Gascon does not fit in. It is all wrong, you see. I really don't understand. Hercule Poirot murmured. The trouble is there's too much sauce over the bad fish. My dear sir, Hercule Poirot smiled. You'll be having me locked up as a lunatic soon, Monsieur le Docteur, but I'm not really a mental case. Just a man who has a liking for order and method and who's worried that when he comes across a fact that does not fit in. I must ask you to forgive me for having given you so much trouble. He rose and the doctor rose also. You know, said McAndrew, Honestly, I can't see anything in the least bit suspicious about the death of Henry Gascon. I say he fell. You say somebody pushed him. It's all well in the air. Hercule Poirot sighed. Yes, he said. It is, worm it is workmanlike. Somebody has made a good job of it. So you still think? The little man spread out his hands. I'm an obstinate man. A man with little idea and nothing to support it. By the way, did Henry Gascon have false teeth? No, his own teeth were in excellent preservation, very credible indeed, at his age. He looked after them well. They were white and well brushed. Yes, I noticed them particularly. Teeth tend to grow a little yellow as one grows older, but they were in good condition. Not discolored in any way? No, I don't think he was a smoker, if that's what you mean. I didn't mean that precisely. It was just a long shot, which probably will not come off. Goodbye, Dr. McAndrew, and thank you for your kindness. He shook the doctor's hand and departed. And now, he said, for the long shot. At the gallant endeavor, he sat down at the same table which he had shared with Bonington. The girl who served him was not Molly. Molly, the girl told him, was away on a holiday. It was only just seven and Hercule Poirot found no difficulty in entering into conversation with the girl on the subject of old Mr. Gascon. Yes, she said, he'd been here for years and years, but none of us girls ever knew his name. We saw about the inquest in the paper and there was a picture of him. There, I said to Molly, if that isn't our old father time, as we used to call him. He dined here on the evening of his death, did he not? That's right, Thursday the 3rd. He was always here on a Thursday. Tuesdays and Thursdays, punctual as a clock. You don't remember, I suppose, what he had for dinner. Hmm, now let me see. It was a mulligatawny soup. That's right, and beefsteak pudding. Or was it the mutton? No pudding, that's right. And blackberry and apple pie and cheese. And then to think of him going home and falling down those stairs at the very same evening? <gasps> a frayed dressing gown cord, they said it was, that caused it all. Of course, his clothes were always something awful, old-fashioned and put on anyhow, and all tattered, and yet he had kind of air. 
all the same, as though he was somebody. Oh, we get all sorts of interesting customers here. She moved off. Hercule Poirot ate his filleted sole. His eyes showed a green light. It is odd, he said to himself, how the cleverest people slip over details. Bonington will not be interested. But the time had not yet come for leisurely discussion with Bonington. Armed with introductions from a certain influential quarter, Hercule Poirot found no difficulty at all in dealing with the corner for the district, the coroner for the district. A curious figure, the deceased man Gascon, he'd observed, a lonely, eccentric old fellow, but his decease seems to arouse an unusual amount of attention. He looked with some curiosity as, at his visitor as he spoke. Hercule Poirot chose his words carefully. There are circumstances connected with it, monsieur, which make investigation desirable. Well, how can I help you? It is, I believe, with your province to order documents produced in your court to be destroyed or to be impounded as you think fit. A certain letter was found in the pocket of Henry Gascon's dressing gown, was it not? That is so. A letter from his nephew, Dr. George Lorimer? Quite correct. The letter was produced at the inquest uh, as helping to fix the time of death, which was corroborated by the medical evidence. Exactly. Is that letter still available? Hercule Poirot waited rather anxiously for the reply. When he heard that the letter was still available for examination, he drew a sigh of relief. <sighs> when it was finally produced, he studied it with some care. It was written in a slightly cramped handwriting with a stylographic pen, and it ran as follows. Dear Uncle Henry, I am sorry to tell you that I have no success as regards Uncle Anthony. He showed no enthusiasm for a visit from you and would give me no reply to your request that he would let bygones be bygones. He is, of course, extremely ill, and his mind is inclined to wander. I should fancy that the end is very near. He seemed hardly to remember who you were. I am sorry to have failed you, but I can assure you that I did my best. Your affectionate nephew, George Lorimer. The letter itself was dated the 3rd of November. Poirot glanced in the envelope's postmark. 4.30 p.m., 3rd of November. He murmured, it is beautifully in order, is it not? Kingston Hill was his next objective. After a little trouble with the exercise of good humored pertinency, pertinency, pertinacity, he obtained an interview with Amelia Hill, a cook housekeeper to the late George Ga Anthony Gascon. Mrs. Hill was inclined to be stiff and suspicious at first, but the charming geniality of this strange looking foreigner would have had his, its effect on a stone. Miss Amelia Hill began to unbend. She found herself, as had so many other women before, pouring out her troubles to a really sympathetic listener. For 14 years, he had, she had charge of Mr. Gascon's household. Not an easy job. No, indeed, many a woman would have quailed under the burdens she had to bear. Eccentric the poor gentleman was, and there was no denying it. Remarkably close with his money, a kind of mania with him it was. And he, as rich gentleman as he might be, but Mrs. Hill had served him faithfully and put up with his ways, and naturally she'd expected at any rate a remembrance. But no, nothing at all. Just an old will that left all his money to his wife, and if she predeceased him, then everything to his brother, Henry. A will made years ago. It did not seem fair. Gradually, Hercule Poirot detached her from her main theme of unsatisfied cupidity. It was indeed a heartless injustice. Mrs. Hill could not be blamed for feeling hurt and surprised. It was well known that Mr. Gascon was tight-fisted about money. It had even been said that, he, that the dead man had refused his own brother assistance. Mrs. Hill probably knew all about that. Was it that Dr. Lorimer came to see him? And what was it about? Asked Mrs. Hill. 
I knew it was something about his brother, but I thought it was just that his brother wanted to be reconciled. They'd quarreled years ago. I understand, said Poirot, that Mr. Gascon refused absolutely. That's right enough, said Mrs. Hill with a nod. Henry, he says, rather weak-like. What's this about Henry? Haven't seen him for years and don't want to. Quarrelsome, pen, quarrelsome fellow, Henry, just that. The conversation then reverted to Mrs. Hill's own special grievances and the unfeeling attitude of the late Mr. Gascon's solicitor. With some difficulty, Hercule Poirot took his leave without breaking off the conversation too abruptly. And so, just after the dinner hour, he came to Elmcrest, Dorset Road, Wimbledon, the residence of Dr. George Lorimer. The doctor was in. Hercule Poirot was shown into the surgery, and there presently Dr. George Lorimer came to him, obviously just risen from the dinner table. I'm not a patient doctor, said Hercule Poirot, and my coming here is perhaps somewhat of an of an impertinence, but I'm an old man and I believe in plain and direct dealing. <sighs> I do not care for lawyers and their long-winded roundabout methods. He had certainly aroused Lorimer's interest. The doctor was a clean-shaven man of middle height. His hair was brown, but his eyelashes were almost white, which gave his eyes a pale, boiled appearance. His manner was brisk and not without humor. Lawyers, he said, raising his eyebrows. Hate the fellows. You rouse my curiosity, my dear sir. Pray sit down. Poirot did so and then produced one of his professional cards which he handed to the doctor. George Lorimer's white eyelashes blinked. Poirot leaned forward confident, confidentially. A good many of my clients are women, he said. Naturally, said Dr. George Lorimer with a slight twinkle. As you say, naturally, agreed Poirot. Poirot. Women distrust the official police. They prefer private investigations. They do not want to have their troubles made public. An elderly woman came to consult me a few days ago. She was unhappy about a husband she'd quarreled with many years before. This husband of hers was your uncle, the late Mr. Gascon. George Lorimer's face went purple. My uncle? Nonsense. His wife died many years ago. Not your uncle, Mr. Anthony Gascon. Your uncle, Mr. Henry Gascon. Uncle Henry? But he wasn't married. Oh, yes he was, said Hercule Poirot, lying unblushingly. Not a doubt of it. The lady even brought along her marriage certificate. It's a lie, said George Lorimer. His face was now as purple as a plum. I don't believe it. You're an imprudent liar. It is too bad, is it not, said Poirot. You've committed murder for nothing. Murder? Lorimer's voice quivered. His pale eyes bulged with terror. By the way, said Poirot, I see you've been eating blackberry tart again, an unwise habit. Blackberries are said to be full of vitamins, but they may be deadly in other ways. On this occasion, I rather fancy they have helped to put a rope around a man's neck. Your neck, Dr. Lorimer. You see, mon ami, where you went wrong was over your fundamental assumption. Hercule Poirot, beaming placidly across the table at his friend, waved an expository hand. A man under severe mental stress doesn't choose that time to do something that he's never done before. His reflexes just follow the track of least resistance. A man who is upset about something might conceivably come down to dinner dressed in his pajamas, but they will be his own pajamas, not somebody else's. A man who dislikes thick soup, suet pudding, and blackberries suddenly orders all three on one evening, you say, because he is thinking of something else. But I say that a man who has got something on his mind will order automatically the dish he has ordered most often before. Ah, bien then, what other exclamation, explanation could there be? I simply could not think of a reasonable explanation, and I was worried. The incident was all wrong. It did not fit. I have an orderly mind, and I like things to fit. Mr. Gascon's dinner worried me. Then you told me that the man disappeared. 
He had missed a Tuesday and a Thursday, the first time for years. I liked that even less. A queer hypothesis sprang up in my mind. If I write about it, the man was dead. I made inquiries. The man was dead. And he was very neatly and tidily dead. In other words, the bad fish was covered up with the sauce. He had been seen in the King's Road at 7 o'clock. He had had dinner at 7.30, two hours before he died. It all fitted in. The evidence of the stomach contents, the evidence of the letter. Much too much sauce. You couldn't have seen the fish at all. Devoted nephew wrote the letter. Devoted nephew had beautiful alibi for the time of death. Death very simple. A fall down the stairs. Simple accident? Simple murder? Everyone says the former. Devoted nephew only surviving relative. Devoted nephew will inherit. But is there anything to inherit? Uncle notoriously poor. But there is a brother, and brother in this time had married a rich wife, and brother lives in a big rich house on Kingston Hill. So it would seem that rich wife must have left him all her money. You see the sequence. Rich, life, rich wife leaves money to Anthony. Anthony leaves money to Henry. Henny's money goes to George. A complete chain. All very pretty in theory, said Bonnington. But what did you do? Once you know, you can usually get a hold of what you want. Henry had died two hours after a meal. That is all the inquest really bothered about. But supposing the meal was not dinner, but lunch. Put yourself in George's place. George wants money, badly. Anthony Gascon is dying, but his death is no good to George. His money goes to Henry, and Henry Gascon may live for years. So Henry must die too, and the sooner the better, but his death must take place after Anthony's, and at the same time, George must have his alibi. Henry's habit of dining regularly at a restaurant on two evenings of the week suggests an alibi to George. Being a cautious fellow, he tries his plan out first. He impersonates his uncle on Monday evening at the restaurant in question. It goes without a hitch. Everyone there accepts him as his uncle. He's satisfied. He has only to wait until Uncle Anthony shows definite signs of pegging out. The time comes. He writes a letter to his uncle on the afternoon of the 2nd November, but dates it to the 3rd. He comes up to town on the afternoon of the 3rd, calls on his uncle, and carries his scheme into action. A sharp shove and down the stairs goes old Uncle Henry. George hunts about the letter for the letter he has written and shoves it in the pocket of his uncle's dressing gown. At 7.30, he is at the gallant endeavor. Beard, bushy eyebrows, all complete. Undoubtedly, Mr. Henry Gascon is alive at 7.30. Then a rapid metamorphosis in a lavatory and back full speed in his car to Wimbledon and an evening of bridge, the perfect alibi. Mr. Bonington looked at him. But the postmark on the letter? Oh, that was very simple. The postmark was smudgy. Why? It had been altered with a lamp black from 2nd November to 3rd November. You would not notice it unless you were looking for it. And finally, there were the blackbirds. Blackbirds? Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie, or blackberries if you to prefer to be literal. George, you comprehend, was after all not quite a good enough actor. Do you remember the fellow who blacked himself all over to play Othello? That is the kind of actor you've got to be in crime. George looked like his uncle, and walked like his uncle, and spoke like his uncle, and had his uncle's beard and eyebrows, but he forgot to eat like his uncle. He ordered the dishes that he himself liked. Blackberries discolor the teeth. The corpse's teeth were not discolored. And yet, Henry Gascon ate blackberries at the gallant endeavor that night. But there were no blackberries in the stomach, I asked this morning. And George had been full enough to keep the beard and the rest of the makeup. Oh, plenty of evidence that once you look for it, you've got it. I called on George and rattled him and finished it. That finished it. He had been eating blackberries again, by the way. A greedy fellow. Cared a lot about his food. Ah, bien. Greed will hang him all right, I guess. Unless I am very much mistaken. A waitress brought them two portions of blackberry and apple tart. 
Take it away, said Bonington. One can't be too careful. Bring me a small helping of sago pudding. And that is the end of that mystery. Which was Four and Twenty Blackbirds by Agatha Christie. Again, my name is Nalani Brown. I'm the philanthropy coordinator at Frank Toby Jones. And thanks for listening while I read.